الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. So there are quite quite a few questions. I have almost 30 questions and uh, many of them are multi-part so we'll just jump right in inshallah. And this is again these questions are anonymous and there are no order I just I printed them out and we'll take them as they come one by one. Please explain what the Quran says about temporary marriage, muta. It is known as sige in Iran. Can a woman go for this marriage and leave the husband without consequences? What if there will be a child and what about the mahr, etc.? Temporary marriage is one of the uh, fiqhi issues that uh, divides the Sunnis and the Shias. Uh, it's something that none of the Sunni schools acknowledge. And it's something that is considered abrogated, mansukh. Uh, it existed in the early part of the, uh, the time of the companions. And uh, it was later made forbidden. So for us, the temporary marriage is, is not permissible. Some of the Shia allow it, but it's considered highly disliked by them. So uh, a common Sunni misconception is that the Shias are, you know, all the Shias are engaging in this. And that's, that's not the case. Uh, in the in the Shia fiqh, in the Jafari fiqh, it's a marriage. It's a it's a normal marriage, but it's given a certain time period. So in the contract, you know, I'm going to marry you for a week. I'm going to marry you for a month. I'm going to marry you for a year, and then that makes in their fiqh the marriage halal, the mahr necessary, the uh, any uh, progeny that happen uh, that would come would be attributed to the parents, so on and so forth. But it's something that is not permissible uh, for us, and as I said, it's something that is. Uh, from my understanding, something that is highly disliked and frowned upon by the Shia. I was in Dammam, Saudi Arabia. There was a cemetery in front of our house. I saw one day people with bulldozers on it. Is it allowed to plow through a cemetery in Islam? What about the bodies? I mean, not knowing the details of what was happening, but the general uh, question is, can you plow over a cemetery? No, of course not. That's, that would be haram because the cemetery is the resting place of our brothers and sisters. And it has uh, a certain sanctity to it. Um, and in normal circumstances, that wouldn't be, be permissible. Now, there are some extenuating circumstances where, from one point of view, all of Earth, at some point, somebody was buried somewhere. So from that point of view, uh, another one can extrapolate from this. Well, what happens if we were building something or building a housing unit or an office building or a commercial center or something like that, and then we found that there were graves unbeknown. So there are different ways. That, so the fuqaha have different ways of dealing with, with those circumstances. Unbeknownst, there's you know, some kind of dispensation. Knowingly, no, that's not permissible. In some parts of the Muslim world, some marriages are legally done for convenience and ulterior motives and sexual exploit. And then immediately there is talaq, is this halal. This has to do with people's intentions. If... The conditions exist in the marriage that there is a, uh, a correct marriage contract, that there is, uh, you know, somebody's not marrying a, a haram relative, uh, that there's the mahar, you know, so on, you know, the, the legal conditions, then the marriage is valid, just like any type of contract would be valid. But this, the question has to do with the niyyah, with the intention. As the Prophet taught us, all actions are based on intention. So if somebody's intending by the marriage or the marriage contract, something haram, then they're going to receive some kind of, of sin. And that's why consent is very important when it comes to marriage, that there has to be consent on both sides. And as a matter of fact, that's why in Islam, the marriage contract begins with the woman. The woman is the one that makes the proposal, not the man, to ensure that her rights are, are guarded and that the man is the one that has to accept those conditions. So a woman can add conditions to the marriage contract. And as long as the man accepts them, then the, the marriage is valid. Is there an authentic hadith that states that if you do not speak to someone for the three days, your dua is not accepted? Can you please elaborate on this? And are there exceptions to this, such as avoiding escalation? There are many hadith that talk about the impermissibility uh, of a Muslim avoiding or a Muslim not speaking to their Muslim brother and sister for more than three days. 
And the hadith that the questioner is referring to most likely is the hadith of the 15th of Sha'ban, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a hadith in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, forgives all of the people that are making dua on that day, except the person who is avoiding their Muslim brother and sister. The other hadith that are specific about not speaking to your Muslim brother and sister for more than three days is actually even worse than, even more intense than this, which is that the person, uh, you know, God forbid, and may Allah Ta'ala protect us, can, that can cast somebody into the hellfire. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. So what does that mean? There are many hadith with that phraseology. What does that mean? So there are different types of, of avoiding your brother and sister. There is dispensation in the Sharia for avoiding your brother and sister or avoiding another Muslim if it is a way of disciplining them. So for example, my, one of my children would do something wrong and I would ignore them for a day or two to emphasize for them how serious that was. You know, a parent to a child, uh, a, a teacher to a student, so on and so forth. So that exists. So that's a disciplinary. So that's not part of what we're talking about. There's also a concept in the Sharia of avoiding dealing with people of open bid'ah. So people that are um, just, they have the wrong Islam or, or they're, you know, crazy, the crazies, you know, in, in the community and they're just openly, they, they do weird things, they say weird things. And you say, no, I don't want to, I'm not going to be with those people because they're just off, you know, off what is normal. Uh, as a way of avoiding contact with that bid'ah. That, 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 so that's not part of what we're talking about. What we're talking about or what the questioner is talking about is that me and a, and a, a friend or me and a relative, we have a falling out and I'm, just, I'm never going to talk to you again. That's what's haram. Meaning that when, they, when I see them, I don't say salam and they don't say salam. Uh, I go out of my way not to be with them. I go out of my way not to talk to them. That's, that's a, big, a big problem. A big, big sin, as a matter of fact, and many dozens and dozens of hadith that talk about that. So this is not a good, a good habit. And you find this, unfortunately, a lot in families. You'll find that there are family feuds. And uh, when you analyze them, they're all back to some kind of dunya, nafsi aspect. Somebody feels wrong. Somebody feels slighted. Oh, they did this at my wedding, or they did this in, in, in this incident, and we're never going to speak to them again. That's not our way. How do you break that? By saying, assalamu alaikum to them. You know, maybe it's Eid, you send them a message. Uh, maybe it's somebody's birthday, you send them a message. You know, it doesn't mean that you got to speak. You have to be their best friend. Sometimes they're just, you know, the relationship is damaged. But you don't want to be in a position where you are avoiding and not speaking to them at all. Is it true that you cannot make dua for a non-Muslim except to ask Allah to guide them? Allah Ta'ala says, uh, that my mercy encompasses everything, everything, Muslim, non-Muslim, inanimate objects, the universe, everything in the created world. Allah Ta'ala's mercy extends to everything. So how can we not ask for Allah's mercy for something that Allah Ta'ala himself has already asked, uh, has already indicated that his mercy uh, extends to. So there's nothing haram with that, inshallah. On Fridays, one Iranian lady visitor wanted a muhr. I believe that's how it's pronounced. I gave her a piece of folded cloth. Is it allowed if we buy some muhrs for ICCP and use when needed? In, in the Ja'fari madhab, one of the conditions for their prayer is that the sujood has to be on a natural, non-fabricated uh, substance. So many... So many of the uh, Shia mosques, they have these clay, you know, like tablets or circular tablets that they use for their sujood. In the Sunni schools, it is sunnah to pray on natural uh, unfabricated products. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a necessity of the prayer, but it's a sunnah. So the way that we can deal with this or we can address this out of respect for our Shia brothers and sisters that might want to come to our mosque, is we can have straw mats, straw mats in the masjid, uh, or straw mats that are like sort of the size of a prayer rug. 
that can easily be rolled up, you know, bamboo or some kind of straw or something like that. And they can pray on them. Why wouldn't we go buy the, the mohr? Because this item is now a symbol of tashayyo. It's a symbol of Shia Islam. And we're not a Shia mosque, we're a Sunni mosque, but we respect our brothers and sisters. So we wouldn't go out and buy that specific thing because somebody's going to come to the mosque and see it and think, oh, this is a Shia mosque because now it's a symbol. But to acknowledge that this is how they pray and to acknowledge that this is what they do, we can provide straw mats and we can fold them up. And as a matter of fact, if you, in many North African mosques, sort of in Libya, uh, west to Morocco and Mauritania, Tunisia, Algeria, many, uh, because it's a, it's a sunnah, uh, especially pronounced in the Maliki Madhab and all of these countries are Maliki, you find straw mats in the masajid all the time. So there are ways that we can uh, be respectful, but at the same time, maintaining our identity, which is important. Is financing a car or house through conventional financing, as opposed to Islamic financing like guidance or UIF, considered usury and therefore forbidden in most madhabs? No, the position that we follow uh, is that as long as when you are financing something, there's a thing, there's an object, a house, a car, a furniture, whatever, then the finance transaction is halal. So that's a principle of, of modern, of, of our modern fatwa system. I would like to develop more intimate relationship with the Quran, but do not know where to start. My daily readings seem routine, not heartfelt. Do I begin learning Arabic, delve into tafsir? Are there any online programs you recommend for guidance and following? So the Qur'an is, is one of these things that you can approach it from multiple angles at the same time. One thing that I like to recommend is for people to listen to the Qur'an. It's so easy that you know you have your, your phone and you have an, a Qur'an app and you can find a, a reciter whom you, you have an affinity towards. And to get used to listening to the Qur'an, having the Qur'an playing all the time uh, is something that is very powerful and it will have an impact on you. It's not going to have as much of an impact, of course, as understanding the verses. So finding a resource that you can understand, like say, uh, you are you really like the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam, and you, like, you want to learn about that. So take that opportunity to learn what those verses are saying. Altafsir.com, A-L-T-A-F-S-I-R, Altafsir.com is, is an online resource that I recommend uh, to people where there are dozens of languages. The Quran is, you can access the Quran in dozens of languages. And in English, um, I don't know how many tafsirs are available, but there are multiple tafsirs available in English. In addition to all of the known English translations of the Quran, if you select a surah, select a verse, you can simply cycle through the different translations of the verse. It's a very easy to use uh, website. Uh, it's trusted. I know the people who have run it. I work with them on another project. So that's something that I would recommend. So learning the verses of the Quran, of course, learning Arabic would help the Arabic of the Quran. So there are, there are courses that you can find online that teach Arabic, Quranic Arabic, uh, because there are a limited amount of words in the Quran and roots, Arabic roots that are used in the verses of the Quran. So obviously, if you learn them, you're going to have an exponentially higher of more that you read. So without doubt, all of these approaches. One of the things that, one of the themes for tonight, and, and, and I found in the questions, is many of the questions come from this binary mentality. It's either this or this. And unfortunately, as people that, uh, as Westerners, this is one of our handicaps. One of our handicaps, one of the, the ways that the Western mind thinks is everything is a binary. It's black or it's white. It's yes or it's no. It's this or it's that. You're with me or you're against me. You support this or you don't support this. This idea that there's, no, it's not binary or, or even tertiary, but there are all of these shades. That's something that is found more in the East. And one of the frustrations that Westerners have when they you know, journey to the East might be that they, they, you'll hear comments like, it's not organized, it's random. Uh, they drive all over the place. They don't follow the rules. This is an extension of this, well, it's not, it's not binary. The rules are not binary. 
So in some aspects of life, it, it, it's a problem, like in traffic laws, uh, of course, you have to follow the rules. But in most other aspects like this, it's not binary. So there's not one answer. Listen to the Quran. Uh, look at the Quran, even just, even just holding the Mus'haf and looking at it, you get reward for looking at those verses. Uh, there are many beautiful calligraphic verses that you can adorn your house with or your office with or your prayer room with. Uh, listening to it looking at it, uh, reading the translation, uh, reading a tafsir in English. In English, you know, the tafsir of Al-Jalalain is translated. The tafsir of Imam Al-Razi, there's a huge project to translate the whole thing. I think the first two volumes is, is, are translated. A tafsir of Al-Baydawi. Uh, I think there's a, um, the tafsir of Ibn Ajiba, which is a later Sufi tafsir. Uh, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. All of these are tafsir that you can find in English. So listening to the Quran is going to have one impact. Reading the tafsir will have another impact. Learning the Arabic or some of the Arabic will have yet another impact, so on and so forth. The important thing is that we want to continue to have a relationship with the Quran and don't let the binary mentality stop you or thwart you from those efforts. If the man of a house is exhibiting mental illness and does not have sound judgment or is extreme in behavior, do the wife and children have the right not to listen to him? This has an impact on the family and the health of the mental state of family members. Is there general advice you have for the situation? And the problem with this question is if I say yes, then every woman who thinks her husband is crazy and every woman, every Muslim woman I know at some point thinks her husband is crazy, is going to be like, oh, Dr. Tariq said that I don't have to listen to you. So this is very subjective, what, you know, exhibiting mental illness and whatnot. Theoretically, of course, if, if a man loses it and starts doing crazy things in the house and things like that, of course, there's going to be a point where, okay, the man has lost his, his sanity and uh, you're not going to have to necessarily follow that. But I don't want people to take this as an excuse, you know, to create problems at home. The home is supposed to be built on mawadda and rahmah, as Allah Ta'ala says, love, mutual respect, mercy. And uh, these are the themes that we need to search for in our homes. This idea of who's obeying who in the home, if we start to think like that, then we've kind of reduced family life to, to, to rules and, and who's obeying who. And that's not really how Allah Ta'ala has described it for us. Allah Ta'ala has described it to us that, that a home is a plea. You know, the home in Arabic, the word for home in Arabic is maskan, from sakana. It's a place of sakina. The words that begin with the letter meme, maskan, masjid, the place of sujood, matam, the place of restaurant, the place where you eat, maskan. So the home in the Arabic language is called the place of sakina, the place of peace and tranquility. That's, those are the themes that we need. If we start auditing one another and see who's obeying who, then we've kind of lost the, the spirit of, of home life and married life and things like that. So obviously, if, for the question of there is some serious mental illness or extreme behavior, then yes, of course, the, the, you, know, you, can't, you shouldn't follow, follow that because the, uh, there's no dictatorship in, in the household. But I don't want this to be an excuse for there to be further problems. Okay, there's a lengthy question here about free will. And as a matter of fact, one of the later questions I got before I signed on was also about free will. Um, so I don't think I'm going to read all of it, but let me read some of it. Currently in research universities, the faith of Muslim students are challenged with human free will in a predetermined universe is the subject of complex academic debate under the heading of determinism in scientific disciplines such as mathematics, physics, et cetera, et cetera. How do we rationally explain the existence of free will in a divinely preordained universe with pre-recorded history? And then the person mentions all of these verses, Allah creator of all things, Allah has created you and what you make. Nothing happens except that Allah has decreed it for us, so on and so forth. To understand free will and this issue of free will and predetermination, it's important to understand what the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means. When we talk about, so rather than focusing on free will and predetermination as it has to do with me, 
think about what is Allah's knowledge? Is Allah's knowledge all encompassing? Yes, of course, that's something that we believe and that's a fundamental aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah's knowledge is all encompassing, then that means, that must mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything that was, is, and will be. So in Allah's knowledge, Keep in mind that there's no time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not, is not a being in time. We are a being in time. But the dimensions that creation is created in, space, time, mass, color, location, uh, possession, all of these things, which in the study of logic are, are uh, we call them in, in Islamic logic, al-ashr al-maqulat, uh, the 10 dimensions, None of these apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kamithlihi shay. Nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not like anything. So one of those things is time. There is no time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from Allah's perspective, if we can say that, um, I, don't, I, don't, I usually have a stick next to me. I don't have a stick, but, uh, you know, if you use this piece of paper, you know, if this is the, if this, just the edge of the page, if this is time, you know, we are like on the line of time. So from our perspective, we can, we can remember what happened before. We know what's happening now. We don't know what's happening in the future. But from Allah's perspective, it's all one thing. There is no past, present, and future with Allah. And that's how we start to understand how we reconcile the two. From our point of view, we are free because we, are, we, we, we do things and we will be rewarded or punished, God forbid, for the things that we do. Why would, why would we be morally responsible if everything is just predetermined? So when we, the word predetermined in English has a loaded Western meaning to it. This idea of, deter, even in the questioner said determinism. We're not saying that in Islam. We're saying that Allah knows what will happen. Allah allows what has happened. But you as the person, as the act of the person conducting that action, you are responsible for what happens. You don't know what's going to happen. So you have to try and you have to plan and you have to do good and and so on and so forth. It's actually a quite a simple thing from Islam. This problem of free will and predetermination really is a Western problem. And of course, you know, all of these uh, re research universities, these are all bastions of secular, uh, in the West now, secular uh, atheistic thinking. You know, so uh, when you go to the university, this is not where, you're, where you go to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't talk about that kind of stuff in the university. It's almost, you know, laughable if you're a believer and you go to these classes and I've, I've been in classes where the professor will laugh at people who profess uh, belief in God and things like that. So this is the, the, the role of, of people like me and, and the masjid and our community is to reinforce our belief uh, and to help our children understand the background of why the university is like that now. Because if you understand the genesis of that or, or where that comes from, it'll be easier for you to deal with it. You know, we, we, we live in a society that for the last couple hundred years has on purpose put metaphysics and religion and cast it to the side completely in its way of thinking. So that's, in a, in a 200 years later, this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get these type of, of, of uh, situations where um, they will profess that there is a problem between revelation and science or reason and revelation. But we don't have, we've never had this problem. This is a uniquely European problem. Islam has never had, our leading scientists were the ulama. Yeah, we have no problem whatsoever with scientific discovery. We invented the scientific method. Imam al-Razi talked about the empirical, uh, the empirical method long before Bacon talked about it. As a matter of fact, many, many ulama are of the understanding that Western thinkers like Roger Bacon and others took the scientific method and the empirical method from the science of usul al-fiqh as articulated by people like al-Ghazali, by Imam al-Razi, so on and so forth. So we have a, our, our religious belief is completely different. We have had no such experience in Islam ever that there is some kind of conflict between science and religion between because we understand what I just said is that this is about the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But of course, I'm responsible for my actions. And it's a, it's a, balanced, it's a balanced approach. A clarifying question, per my understanding, the Qur'an refers to Sayyidina Ibrahim as the first Muslim. Therefore, how do we categorize previous MBA? Again, this is the, our Western binary thinking. 
Yani Allah calls Ibrahim alayhi salam the first Muslim, meaning the first Muslim of his time or the first Muslim of his area or the first Muslim of his region, so on and so forth. Not absolutely the first Muslim because all of the Anbiya were muahidun, they were all uh, monotheists, etc. If I sleep whilst reciting the Quran for an hour, or uh, sorry, for half an hour or so, is it permissible for me to continue to read when I wake up from my sleep or do I have to make wudu again? I read juz by juz the Quran, not the whole Quran with the 30 juz altogether. Oh, okay, I see. I re you read the juz, like the, the booklet is one juz at a time. One juz, a booklet of one juz, that's not the Quran in the fiqhi definition. As I said before, the fiqhi definition of the Quran is the entire mushaf from the Surah Al-Fatiha to Surah Al-Nas. That book, that mushaf, that's where most of the ulama say you have to have wudu to read from it, with the exception of Ibn Hazm, who said you don't have to have wudu, and that's the position that I follow and the position that I teach, in order that we do not prevent ourselves from having a relationship with the Quran. However, in this case, if the person is just reading a juz at a time, there is no precondition to have wudu uh, when you touch that. So in this case, it's fine. Whilst reading the Quran, is it permissible to cross your legs for comfort, to sit awkwardly, or should one sit as if in prayer whilst reciting the Quran, to respect the Quran? Can one recite while lying down on bed? Is this a restful and easy on my body, and sometimes I fall asleep reciting? That's fine, because all of this is cultural and subjective. If you go to Mauritania, they're, they lie down you know, on the floor all the time, reading Quran, studying the teacher, the student. So th this is all, all cultural. As long as you're not doing it with the intention of disrespect, it's fine. I lost my daughter a few years ago. Allah Ta'ala have mercy on her and make it easy for your family. She was a good person and did a lot of good to people, but she did not pray her daily prayers. I pray two rakat for her every day since she passed, but would like to know what else can I do for her? So... One of the things that we can't do for the deceased is pray for the, uh, that's, that's going to sound wrong the way I said it. Forget what I just said. Let me start over. If somebody has passed away and missed fasting days, the descendants can fast on their behalf. If somebody has passed away and not performed hajj, the descendants can perform hajj on their behalf. All of those things except the prayer. Because Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna salata kana kitab and that prayer has been prescribed to each person in its allotted time. So if somebody has passed away and missed their prayers, you as the living descendant can't make up those prayers for them. So, but you can do sadaqa, you can give charity, you can make dua, you can recite the Quran and donate the reward to them, you can uh, create some sort of sadaqa jari, and you, know, you can donate to the mosque in their name, and that's an ongoing charity, so on and so forth. Uh, I stopped myself in the beginning because I used the word prayer because obviously in English, we, we, the word prayer includes our salah, our namaz, and our dua. So I didn't want it to make it sound like you can't make dua. No, you can make dua, of course. And inshallah, Allah is merciful. Allah is the mother, as the parent or father or mother, Allah will accept your dua. But you can't make up the prayers that they missed. That's something that's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray my five daily prayers and I do zikr and also midnight prayers, but I don't know how to read the Qur'an. Is there any other things I can do? Can I just listen to the Qur'an and say, Ameen, since I can't read the Qur'an? Yes. I encourage everyone to listen to the Qur'an. I can't encourage that enough. I have missed far of the prayers from when I was young that I'm currently making up. Okay, good for you. May I do these make-up prayers during times that prayers are discouraged? Yes, because if you have a pre- uh, reason, pre-existing reason, you know, in the medicine, they say pre-existing condition. If you have a pre-existing reason for saying a prayer, then the times when prayers are discouraged and forbidden don't apply for you. When the Sharia says, or we find a hadith that says at this time, I, when the sun is rising, or at this time after asa prayer is discouraged, etc., that means mutlaq as-salah, just regular prayer. I'm just going to stand and pray two rakahs. That's what it's referring to. Not that I've missed something that I have to pray because that's a fard on me, and the fard supersedes those times. I lost my place. Ah, okay. Can you please provide some guiding principles to identify questions that we should avoid asking, akin to Bani Israel, 
asked in Surah al When I tell you don't ask the question, don't ask the question. Just leave it at that. Again, the, this, I, I, this uh, don't nitpick. So when you ask and I answer and then you follow up and I say, khalas, that's enough, then that means don't ask more. Is it permissible to have one's teeth filled if not medically necessary? Yes. Why are guys' clothing rules less strict than girls? Now, this is a cultural question. This is a, a question spoken from bias. You think because of your cultural bias that the man's dress is, is less strict than a woman, i.e. you see a woman's dress in Islam as restrictive or limiting, so on and so forth. That's our, uh, that's our, cult that's our cultural bias. That, that's a, a, something spoken from by in another culture one would say that uh, the woman is protected that the woman is honored uh, that the woman is valuable uh, and precious and protected and our whole system of sharia and society manifests that and that the man is is you know the man is less so for example i'm just saying this because i want us to be aware of our bias sometimes when we ask questions i understand the question but i'm just saying sometimes we're biased you know, when we ask these questions that's a total western you know islam is repressive baggage in that question i'm not saying that the person asking that question actually meant that but that's a bias it's very clear the dress the way allah ta'ala has told us to dress this is something from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no necessarily rash i can you know try to do oh the man works the woman doesn't work but then what happens if a woman works so i mean that kind of uh, answer doesn't really i don't like those kind of answers because they're limiting there were sahabi yet women sahaba that fought in the battles so i can't say that oh the woman is dressed nicely because she's always at home and the man is dressed you know goes out in shorts because he's working i mean most of the guys i know don't do manual labor they're sitting at a desk or at home. So that, that type of answer doesn't work. The more real answers is Allah says so. And uh, we comply with that to the best of our ability. Why did Allah prescribe a double share for men in the family versus the woman sibling? Will a wilk override this? And is it Islamic to do so? Well, there's only that one instance. There's only that one instance. There are instances in inheritance law where women inherit the same as men. There are instances in inheritance law when women inherit more than men. There are instances in inheritance law when women uh, inherit and men don't inherit at all. The portions of the inheritance are, the size of the portions of the inheritance are all based on the closeness to the deceased. That's the, that's the, measuring stick not the not the gender in the case where there's a man and passes away and he leaves a son and a daughter the son takes the double share and the daughter takes one share because the son's extra share is that he now needs to provide for his sister that's the key and that's what that that's the aspect that just sort of falls you know people forget about that if i inherit a double share and i have a sister that double share means i'm supposed to take care of her uh, and that share that goes to my sister is completely hers. She has no obligation to use it, to spend it, to support her family, so on and so forth. But I, as her brother, you know, even if I'm younger, I still have to support her. So uh, don't forget there's those, those two things. One is the closeness to the deceased is what will determine the, the closer you are, the larger the share. And if there is in this case, the double share, et cetera, it indicates the responsibility, the financial responsibility of one towards the other. Oh, the will. In the in in the in the in the Sharia, we, we have we have something called a bequest, a wasiya. Uh, in the Sunni schools, you can give a wasiya up to one third of your wealth, but no more than that, without the permission of all of those that would inherit. So let's say I have a uh, hundred thousand dollars to my name, I can give one third of that to one person and write that. And then that, that happens. But the rest, the other two thirds, that will have to be distributed through the uh, Sharia portions. Um, I have two time sheets for my town with the start and ending times for the fast. The problem I have is that there is a minute or two discrepancy. Which one do I follow? This is a problem I have avoided talking about because it, it can become a big fitna in the community. Um, if it comes to fasting, follow the earlier time to be more cautious. 
when it comes to praying Fajr, follow the later time to be more cautious. Uh, that's just as a general guideline. There is a more correct answer. I don't want to get into now because it will, I don't want to create fitna about the timetables. But just so you know, there are different ways of calculating Fajr and Aisha, the angle of the sun and whatnot. And there are different fiqh bodies that use different angles to determine that. Now, I've evolved a little bit in my, my uh, I used to be super strict on this, but then I realized after talking to some of my teachers that all of these attempts are really ijtihadi attempts. So I'm not, I don't want to criticize one uh, system. I follow a very specific angle uh, observation of Fajr and Aisha because I believe it to be the most accurate one. But I do also acknowledge that there are other attempts and, and, and you know, and whatnot. So again, to repeat for the person that has this problem, and it's really only a problem with Fajr, is that if you're fasting and you have these two timetables, follow the Fajr, the earlier Fajr to ensure that you have started your fast when it comes to the Fajr prayer itself, then you can follow the later time also to ensure that Fajr has come in that you haven't prayed early. I own several housing properties, townhouses, and I rent them out throughout the year. Do I pay zakah on the value of the townhouses? And if so, what about the mortgage I'm carrying? No, you don't pay zakah on the, the property. You pay zakah on your, the cash that you have in your possession that, that's over the nisab amount that one year has passed. So you don't, you don't pay zakah on the value of, it's not a tax. Uh, please elaborate on how to overcome what Sunnis hear in their head and hearts about the Shia school of thought. In a nutshell, they are not right, totally on the wrong path, etc. As we are all Muslim Americans living in the climate of revising our history and social norms, for example, BLM, Time's Up, domestic violence, sexual orientation, etc. Muslims also have to revise and reorient our perspectives and align with the true practice of Islam and the prophetic style of tolerance and true love for others. How do we negotiate, be okay with the idea of 12 Imams, shrines, or do we? In daily life, how do we impart respect to those who believe maybe not right on a different spectrum belief system, etc.? Okay, well, when it comes to the Shia thing, was there more to that question? Yes, there was more to that question. Please speak about the recordings in our heads about Shia, Ahmadiyya, other groups that we have learned passively to not be on the path and what they should be replaced with as a basic Muslim platform that we can and should inculcate within ourselves. Okay, so with the Shia thing, you know, education, we have to educate ourselves. Uh, anybody who says the kalima, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, anybody who prays to Mecca is a Muslim, uh, our Muslim brother and sister, full stop. Uh, and th that's all you need to know. So the Shia are Muslim, without doubt, without any dispute. There are some differences between us and them that are fiqhi differences. Those are minor. Uh, there are some differences, only five, that are major differences. Uh, those do have some impact, but that's for the ulama to, to discuss. And, and for the last, since the 1950s, there's been a long process of reconciliation between the Sunnis and Shias on those five issues. So we look at the Shia as <clears throat> an a, a, a acknowledged school of thought in which we just have some differences with, just like we would look at any of the other non-Sunni like the Ibadis, uh, like the Zaydis, uh, like the Zahiris, uh, so on and so forth. So education is how we understand this. Um, now, there are extreme Shia and there are extreme Sunnis as well, and that's one of the problems, and, and we reject all of those types of extremisms. Uh, because our way is the middle way, and that is the way of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, this issue about revising, you know, BLM and this, I, I just want to caution us that, that uh, we should feel zero pressure from those type of social movements 
to revise. And Islam is very clear on what it says about race. Islam is very clear what it says about gender. Uh, Islam is very clear about what it says in se sexual orientation. And none, none of that's going to change, not, not, not with time, not with place, not with circumstance, because those are clear in the Quran. There are clear verses there are about gender. There are clear verses about in hadith about sexual orientation. There are clear verses about rooting out racism in our hearts and uh, the Prophet I'm referring to it as a type of jahiliya, so on and so forth. So we do not, we should not feel that we have to carry the baggage of somebody else when our religion has taught us how to deal with those things. I don't think that that's what the questioner meant, but because the way the, the question was phrased, I wanted to, to mention it. <clears throat> of course, there are different types of Shia, by the way, just to get back to the Shia thing. The, the Asherah, the 12 or Shia, are the largest group of the Shia. And the 12 Imams of the Shia are our 12 Imams as well. Those are people, those are descendants of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu and those are from the, the, the pious and the and the pure, and we respect and love all of them. They are great Imams. Um, the Shia revere them uh, maybe in a way that we do not revere them because they, some of the Shia say, or most of the Shia might say that they are masum, that they are infallible. We do not believe in the infallibility of anyone except the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We believe that there are saints and that people are protected, but we do not believe in the infallibility such that whatever they say is, a, is automatically a part of the Sharia. But that's something that can be reconciled. That's not, you know, that's not a make it or break it type of situation. But we revere the Shia as well, uh, that we revere the Imams as well, because these are descendants of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I think that Again, it's education. Maybe many Sunnis don't know that, and that's something that we should talk about. As for the Ahmadis, and as I said before, if the Ahmadis claim, and I don't know because I'm, I'm not you know, in, in the know of this, but if the Ahmadis claim that there is a prophet after Sayyidina Muhammad, a prophet that receives revelation, a prophet who is infallible, a prophet who adds to the Sharia, then they're outside of Islam. Not because I say so, but because they have said so. Because that's not what the kalima means. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad Rasulullah means he is khatam and nabiin. He's the end of the prophet. There's no prophecy after that. So it's not for me to say. If they say that, then khalas, they themselves have removed themselves from Islam. If they say that uh, their guy is a good guy, a cool guy, a mujtahid or something like that, khalas, then they're, they're Muslims, but they might have some false beliefs or false notions. So it goes back to what they, what they say. In either case, <clears throat> this is a theological debate. This has nothing to do with persecution and, and all that kind of nonsense, which is haram. Are credit cards haram? No, as long as you pay, you buy what you can afford and you pay your bill. What, are, what, is our, what should our intention be when we do mundane things? The Sharia, in the Sharia, there are five uh, rulings it's not again it's not binary it's not haram and halal there are other rulings some things are just mubah are permissible some things are mandub some things are recommended so if you're you know brushing your teeth or putting on your clothes you don't have to have a specific intention but if you have a specific intention you will be rewarded for that intention so if you have if you brush your teeth and you say i'm brushing my teeth you know you're saying this subconsciously because it's a sunnah to take care of your teeth you're rewarded Let's say you brush, like you're rewarded two times. Say you brush your teeth just to brush your teeth. You're rewarded once because you're, you're doing something that is recommended, so on and so forth. So you don't have to have a specific niya, but if you do, you will be rewarded multiple times. What are the things that break your wudu? Anything that exits the private parts. That's the rule. Now, some things can exit the private parts that would necessitate ghusl. But that also necessitates wudu. So the rule or the definition is anything that exits the private parts. Or if you pass out, if you lose consciousness. Or if you fall asleep. What is a peer saint? And why do they write a taweez for their students? A peer, my understanding is just the Persian word for sheikh. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but but I understand it is just a sheikh, a teacher, uh, and there are different types of teachers. There are teachers that teach you tajweed. There are teachers that teach you Arabic. There are teachers that teach you hadith. There are teachers that teach you arithmetic, 
And there are teachers that teach you how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about the peer and the saint, we're talking about that latter kind, that the shaykh that teaches you how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how to root out your negative traits, how to arrive at a better relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the shaykh of tasawwuf, it's the shaykh of the tariq, uh, it's the shaykh of tazkiyah, uh, etc. So that's what, you know, and, and they have to be qualified to do that, just like the other teachers have to be qualified to do their things. Are there false teachers and false peers? Of course, just like there are false, you know, uh, arithmetic teachers and false uh, science teachers and, and, and so on and so forth. As far as the ta'wiz, the Sahaba used to write different uh, du'a and verses of the Qur'an that their children would wear. So, and, and there is no prohibition against that. So there's a sunnah attached to that. So to wear something that has like ayat al-Kursi or Allah's name or the Prophet's name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, or you know, something like that, that's all from the realm of, of the permissible. And for the children, you do it for the children for protection. Maybe they haven't learned how to recite ayat al-Kursi yet, or maybe they haven't learned how to make wudu yet. So you want to you know, give them that type of spiritual protection. That's where it comes from. And it has a source in the sunnah. Somebody said that they made a mistake in the third or the fourth rakah. How do they correct it? If you are unsure, meaning they're unsure how many rakahs. If you're unsure, you go with the lower number and you build. So I, did I pray three or four? When I think like that, automatically I say, okay, I'm going to go with three and pray one more. Well, what happens if you end up, you had prayed four and now you've prayed five? The ulama say that's like extra reward for you. So that's how you solve that problem. And then the last question I had, I see there's a lot on the chat, so I'll go to the chat now, but a lot of the last question I had was about left-handed people eating uh, with their left hand and whatnot. Eating with the right hand is a sunnah. It's not a fard. It's not, it's not obligatory. So Allah only bears a soul that they can bear. If somebody's born left-handed and they're used to doing every the way I was born right-handed and that's natural and they can't, then that's fine. It's not haram. Allah created you that way. Uh, the sunnah is to eat with the right when one hand is engaged in eating. So I, I want to go grab something. So I go grab it with my right and I eat it and I drink it. But if both hands are engaged in the eating and drinking process, like I'm holding a fork and knife, the Prophet says I'm ate with both hands as well. So the issue of only eating with the right is th that discussion is when it's only one hand. And even then it's a sunnah, not a fard. Okay, I see that there are some stuff going on here. So let me see. How will you all be celebrating 9-11? You can pass that question. Okay. Go to the next one. Uh, thank you for pointing out that in a Muslim marriage, a contract, the woman has the first say of an agreement this is another right of women in Islam. Actually, yeah, I was talking to somebody recently a couple of days ago and um, they want me to conduct a nikah. The family, uh, uh, I was explaining this and when I said this, that the woman uh, is the one that begins, like the mother got very upset. She's like, that's so odd. And it was the first time that I had to, to articulate it. I said, I was like, well, yeah, I mean, didn't, how did you get married? She's like, I don't remember. My, my father took care of it. I said, well, yeah, what your father did is he offered your hand in marriage to, to your husband and he agreed, et cetera. And she's like, well, why? That sounds like so barbaric. And then you could tell like there's like maybe the idea is that the man is the one that proposes. Maybe it's a cultural thing. I said, but I, I and then I, I, I remembered, well, it's because the, the woman has to ensure that her rights are protected. So she makes the offer. She puts the conditions. For example, a woman can put in the marriage contract that it's stipulated that uh, you can't marry another woman when you're married to me. And that can be in the contract because it's a contract. You can add things. You can add. Uh, uh. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that most people forget about. I want to, there's another question that came in. I, I want to invest in a business that sells coffee, smoothies, but has some pork products. If I donate profit from the pork sales and do not keep it in my income, is it permissible? I will know exactly how much money is made from the pork sales. If you're in the West, 
then that's not haram. It's like if you own a grocery store or something like that, because the Hanafis allow uh, those type of transactions in non-Muslim lands. So in that, if you're in America or in Europe uh, and you've invested in this business uh, and some of that income comes from the selling of the pork, which is considered najis, of course, and haram for us to consume, in that case, it would be permissible. You don't have to donate that money. You mentioned we can pray Dhuhr and Asr together. Can we pray this together as a family and someone lead the prayer? Yes, you can. About the tooth question, can, can one have the teeth filled to even out the teeth not filled, not for me? Yeah, that's fine. The teeth, there's nothing wrong with the teeth filling. Ramon shared a document, a Dropbox document, a PDF that has 80% of Quranic words. Okay, I'll, let me click on it, but I'll check it out later. And that's a good resource for people. Please clarify if we believe that only Prophet Muhammad is infallible or all prophets, alayhim wasalam. No, all of the Anbiya are infallible. I'm sorry if I, I made it seem that's not the case. Part of being a prophet is that you are masoom, that you are infallible. Uh, which is why we do not believe that any of the MBA committed any sins, even though, as is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, in, in the discussion of Yom al-Qiyamah, that some of the MBA will come uh, and will not want to intercede uh, because they will think that they had committed a sin. Like Moses will say, no, I killed the Egyptian by mistake. And uh, Abraham will say, I lied because I said that Sarah was my sister. And so these are not really... Uh, sins but they they will be so embarrassed from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except christ salam, when humanity comes to christ christ mentions no sin but he says it's for my brother muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. anyway we believe in the isma of all of the anbiya that's part of the package of being a prophet is that you are infallible why because the prophet is delivering the message from allah so how can the prophet deliver this divine message unadulterated but but then be flawed themselves how can you sparse out the, you'll start to say, oh, well, maybe the message is corrupted, so on and so forth. So part of our belief is that all of the MBA are, are infallible. Alayhim salam I got the pork question again. I think that's just a repeat of them. that. The share in the will is prescribed in the Quran. Can one still divide equally to boy and girl and go against what is in the Quran? Only if, only if they, they all agreed. So, well, I said that the bequest is one third. Let's say that I want to rearrange all of my uh, will. Everybody that could and would inherit from me, all of them have to agree to that. So if they all agree, you can, you can change it. Why do Muslims fight to touch the Kaaba? Because this is you know, the first house created for Allah Ta'ala was in, was in Mecca. And, uh, you know, it's, you just, it's like a magnetic thing. You're just like attracted to it. You just want to, you know, you know to touch it for the barakah and, and its spiritual significance for us. I mean, it's not, no, other, no other reason uh, than that. But maybe you're thinking also of the black stone. To the black stone, there's a sunnah to, to kiss the black stone, as the Prophet Sallallahu did. Uh, and, th and that's where most of the fighting is, or the, no, I don't want to say fighting, but most of the crowd is. For khula, does the wife need permission from the husband to carry it out, unlike talaq? If so, what recourse does the woman have to carry out the khula if the man refuses? The khula, I translate it as the woman initiated divorce. And it is done through the court system that she, she does not need the man's permission. Um, the man can grant the divorce. So the talaq is the man divorcing the wife. The khula is the wife divorcing the husband, in which case the courts are uh, involved. There's also a fesh, an annulment of the marriage, in which the court just annuls the marriage because something is wrong or something like that. So there are different ways. Again, a common misconception is that a man can divorce a wife, a woman, a woman can divorce a man. That's not that's not true. They're just called different things and they have different procedures.
clarify your comment on Christ and Prophet Muhammad. In the hadith of Yom Al-Qiyamah in Sahih Al-Bukhari, um, everybody's waiting. You know, Allah may Allah Ta'ala make that, that moment easy for us. And all of humanity is going, are going to the different MBA. So Adam, you know, you are the, the father of humanity. Please intercede. We want the hour to start. We want the judgment to start. And Adam will say, oh, I ate from the tree and I'm embarrassed, uh, uh, you know, to ask Allah, ask somebody else. So then all of humanity will go to Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and, or they'll go to Noah, I think. And then Noah uh, will say, but I asked Allah Ta'ala to save my son and, and, and I, I was not supposed to do that. I'm embarrassed. Ask somebody else. They'll go to Abraham. Abraham, alayhi salam, will say, but I, I, I you know, I killed the, the man or he'll say, uh, I lied. Uh, when the people came back to his town and they said, who destroyed all of these idols? And he said, I don't know, ask the big, the big idol. Um, uh, so I'm embarrassed, you know, ask somebody else, so, so on and so forth until they get to Christ, alayhi salam. But Christ mentions no sin. He simply says, it is for my brother Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam. And that is one of the honors that we have in our faith tradition to Jesus, alayhi salam, is, I mean, first of all, all of those previous MBF, those are not sins. The, 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 the point of the hadith is they were embarrassed because of something that they've done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we do not believe that those were sins at all. But it's interesting that in the text of the hadith, Isa alayhi salam mentions nothing at all. And that's one of the special, the, the, the special rank that we have for Sayyidina Isa. Of course, there's no prophet between Isa alayhi salam and Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. That's also one of our beliefs. So we have, you know, we honor all of the MBA. We don't, we don't differentiate between them, but this is one of the, the special things that we have in our, in our tradition towards Jesus. If my husband passes away, is our retirement account part of the inheritance? It depends how the... Uh, it depends how the inheritance, uh, it depends how the retirement account is titled. There are accounts that can be titled joint tenants in the entirety, in which case it's not part of the inheritance. But then you have a beneficiary and I think it automatically goes, I would need to think about, about how to, I need to learn a little bit more about how they are titled to answer properly. But my understanding <clears throat> is that there are beneficiaries are listed and then the, the, the money or the funds automatically go to the beneficiary. In that case, there's a possibility that it might circumvent the inheritance distribution. But I need to think about that. Can you go over the rules of a male doing ghusl? What needs to be covered of the aura? Will want to be in a state of wudu afterward. Oh, ghusl is simply just take a bath or a shower. So you, you're, all of your body, including your hair, needs to be wet. That's it. And the, the, the ghusl also, if you've, if you've done the ghusl, you also are now in a state of wudu. That's so pretty simple. Like talaq, khula have to be done three times. I don't think there's going back from the khula. I have to review that. I think it's a little bit different. So I need to look that. Let me just make a note. Khula. And then retirement. My teenage daughter usually runs errands for me and goes out with friends without a mahram. What is your opinion on this? There's no prohibition of women going out as long as it's safe. So the prohibition or the uh, idea that a woman can only go out with a mahram, that's if it's not safe, then she needs somebody to be with her. But can a woman travel theoretically without a mahram? Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no prohibition against that. The prohibition is if it's not safe. That's what the idea is. Now, there are, there are cultural manifestations. That's something different. I, here, we're just talking about the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay. I believe those are all the questions. 